So this was work I had done a few years ago with, uh, jointly with Peter Glynn. I apologize to a few people in the audience who heard some parts of it, but uh, we had done more work at that time, and now it's time to look at it again. So, uh, selection of best system using large deviations and multi arm bandits. So we have a population, we can sample from these populations, we don't know the expectations, and we want to find the population which has the best mean, the largest mean or the smallest mean. So that's the problem. It's a genetic problem, you can kind of have various versions of this. From large deviations point of view, we actually have a negative result. So I'll walk you through seemingly positive theory, and then I'll tell you what the negative result is. So for, hopefully that's not the end of it, but for today that's the story. And then uh, there's some positive results from using ideas similar to those found in multi-arm bandit literature. I probably won't get time to talk much about multi-arm bandits, but I'll see what I can say. All right, uh, so depopulation or probability distributions are to be compared. Uh, so we do not know these underlying distributions, but we can generate samples from them, independent samples. Goal is to identify a population with the smallest mean and not to actually estimate the means. And that's what we want to exploit using large deviations theory. Selecting the best system is, you has a much faster convergence rate than uh, finding the value of the mean of the best system. So for random variables x, i, i less than or equal to d, our aim is to find the population i star with a minimum mean, right? So if this is not clear, I have a picture for you. Three populations here. I can sample from these three populations independently, and I want to find a population which has the smallest mean. I want. So you can see that the probability of incorrect selection is going to be small, and that's where we'll use large deviations theory. Uh, okay, so some applications, so you can think of stochastic models of different road network designs. I'm sure physics will have many applications too. This is like an example of stochastic, uh, discrete stochastic optimization, basically. You, know, you have discrete number of options, you want to find the best one. So road network designs, finding the one with the least average congestion, given a manufacturing system, evaluating the one, evaluating the best maintenance strategy amongst many maintenance strategies that may exist. Given many medicinal treatments for a given disease, finding the one that causes maximum benefit on the average. What's that? If you have a model of a road design, you know the probability law, whereas you were saying you don't know the probability law, but you can sample something. Uh, well, it can be a complicated network, right? So you know how the inputs, how the vehicles are coming in, what the rules of engagement are, right. but for the average delay, the probability distribution is far too complex to be known. Yeah. Okay, so traditionally this and related problems have been studied by statisticians, operations researchers, and lately by computer scientists. So these are some of the names. Uh, Bubeck is from computer science, this uh, massive literature in this area. I just mentioned very few things here. Underlying as a distributions are typically assumed to be Gaussian, which the faith is it's from central limit theorem, so it's asymptotically valid or Bernoulli, which of course is verifiable whenever it's true. And the underlying analysis typically relies on central limit theorem. So you generate samples from a population independently, the average subtracted from the mean, when you scale it by square root of n, divide, normalized by the standard deviation, converges to Gaussian random variable. So this is the typical standard underlying analysis in, in statistics. So it's assumed that the problems are well separated, so that the best design is separated from other designs by at least a factor of epsilon. Delta is fixed. So you want to control the probability of false selection. And in typical literature, you know, delta is kept at like 5%, 1%. And you analyze the probability of false selection as epsilon goes to zero. And then the flavor of analysis is that you're looking at order of epsilon squared inverse uh, number of samples. And that's because central limit theorem, you know, gives um, you know, uh, I guess you can define things to the order of 1 upon root n. So if you have, uh, if you want that to be epsilon, then you need epsilon square, order of epsilon square inverse number of samples. Okay, so in this talk, we are going to instead keep epsilon fixed and we let delta go to zero. So that's a flavor of uh, our analysis. We are doing a large deviation theory. So we want the probability of incorrect selection to become tiny. Just some historical review, and uh, so Ho et al. in 1990, this is from Howard, observed that probability of false selection decays at an exponential rate for light tail distributions. This was more of an experimental kind of study. 
die in 1996 showed that you know, using large deviation methods, underlying, even if the samples are not independent, but they have some kind of weak dependence, if EX1 is the best design, then probability that you make a false selection, so you will generate samples from each of these populations, and probably the first population has an average sample average, which is greater than the best sample average from the remaining populations. That satisfies the large deviation principle. So in particular, this probability has a large deviation weight function i. So they identified this in some reality. Right? Okay, we looked at this problem in 2004, and the idea was to kind of exploit this large deviations rate function that exists. So how do you allocate resources to different populations uh, to optimize, uh, to you know, reach the decision uh, of um, you know, selecting the best population with the least amount of computational time, keeping the probability of false selection under control? So the thought was, you know, you, PIN is the budget allocated to IF design, these PI sum to one, and if you knew uh, the distributions of the underlying populations, then you have this large deviations principle, so you can identify this large deviation rate function. It turns out to be a very nice convex rate function, so then one can optimize this and find all the PIs. And the underlying fate is that we don't really know the means of the populations, so we certainly don't know these rate functions of, uh, of this probability. But the faith was that you learn from some samples the distributions of the underlying populations, learn these PIs, optimize them, and somehow that will converge and achieve the exponential rate that one really wants to exploit. You know, what we want to exploit is that these probabilities are decaying exponentially, so we want to build algorithms which capture that. Is this any question so far? That's, right, that's the idea, yeah. So you come up with the optimal frequencies. That's right. If you knew the, the distributions, what would your optimal budget be? So you just perform this thought experiment, and then as you learn, you hope that you learn this budget as well. So significant literature since uh, relying on this kind of large deviation analysis, you know, people followed up on this because one can do cute analysis, right? You get nice convex functions, you can see all kinds of things. So in hope in all of this, I kept on, uh, I've said a few times, is that suppose we can, you know, suppose probability of false selection is upper bounded by something which is decaying exponentially with this large deviation rate i, then, you know, we can develop an algorithm which just requires log of one by delta number of samples, scaled by one upon i, so physicists don't, compare, uh, don't uh, complain about constants, so this is just one of those constants here. Uh, but if you choose your n in this manner, then your probability of false selection will be less than equal to delta. So the hope then is that you kind of estimate this rate function i, plug it in here, and you get exponential convergence rate. So we want to get log 1 by delta order convergence rates. Um, so this relies on estimating i from the samples generated. So the big punchline of this uh, talk is that you know, these things cannot be done, and you cannot have ordered log 1 by delta algorithms for this problem unless you have some more information. So even if you could get a lower bound on i, that would work in order, which is of, uh, in order log 1 by delta amount of samples, uh, with, which is correct with probably 1 minus delta by 2, for example, that would also work. That would also do the job for us. Uh, asymptotic hopes, in the spirit of central limit theorem, you know, one kind of generalizes this a little bit. One hopes for algorithms which you take order leg, log one by delta amount of samples and ensure that probability of false selection is less than good delta, at least asymptotically. So at least this, this is true. Probability of false selection divided by delta uh, is less than or equal to one as delta goes to zero. So what we'll do, and, and this is so even when the means are separated, so the best mean is separated from the others by amount epsilon. Epsilon is fixed. So we'll look at this uh, setup. Uh, so f some observations. First of all, order log one by delta samples are necessary. You can't do without that. So think of this. If you had order log one by delta raised to one minus epsilon samples, this is a different epsilon now. There's any tiny epsilon. Then all the x i's lying in some set A, you can choose your set A so that the answer is going to be wrong. Uh, that has a probability which is asymptotically greater than delta. Right? 
So you need order log one by delta samples. And in the setting where the probability of false selection satisfies a large deviation principle, order log one by delta raised to power one plus epsilon is sufficient. So you know, delta inverse into probability of false selection, this has a bound e to the power minus ni, which we may not know, but nonetheless it exists. In that case, you can see that this is going to actually converge to zero, you know, this, is go, this term here is going to be greater than one as delta goes to zero. So it's, it's going to be sufficient. We'll get, um, uh, you will satisfy the criteria that we have, uh, which I call, I guess, asymptotically you have this probability of false selection is small enough. All right, so our contributions, I will argue through a popular implementation using that these rate functions are difficult to estimate accurately using order log one by delta samples. Actually, we'll show that it cannot be done. That's a result by itself, it's a, it would be of interest. In root, we'll identify the large deviations rate function of the empirically estimated large division rate function. Because the game right now is we empirically estimate the large deviation rate function, plug that in and do our simulation. So to do analysis of that, we need rate function of that. So one can, uh, we identify that. And our key negative result is that given any epsilon delta algorithm, so means are separated by epsilon, and uh, you know, probability of false selection is kept to within delta, uh, so that this property holds, we prove that for populations which are mutually absolutely continuous with unbounded support and finite mean, the expected number of samples cannot be order log one by delta. You need more than order, such a, such a policy would require more than order log one by delta number of samples. So that's the, that's a broad conclusion. That's right. That's the next slide, yeah, positive contribution. Under explicitly available moment upper bounds on the, on the samples, we can develop truncation or capping based order log one by delta algorithms epsilon delta with this epsilon delta property. And we'll also, so in this is where you know, we observe that this problem is being studied um, uh, in the multi arm um, bandits uh, literature. So recently their papers, uh, they typically focus on regret analysis, which I won't get time to talk about here. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, they look at these kinds of bounds and they develop a, a, a sequential strategy and that can also be adapted to, the, to our, what I'm calling this is a pure exploration problem. So pure exploration problem is where you find the best design. You're not minimizing the regret, uh, regret is some kind of cost associated with each design. You just want to find the probability of, uh, you just want to find the best design with high probability. That's a pure exploration problem. In any case, so these are positive results. So basic large division, just for, to recap, uh, for, um, you know, most of you would know this, x1, x2, xn are IID samples of x. Suppose A is greater than E of x. Then we have Cramer's bound that sample average is bounded from above by uh, this exponential term here. This is log moment generating function. And uh, you can optimize this theta and then you get this Cramer's theorem. So this I of A is the large division rate function evaluated at A. And this is just the Legend differential transform of the log moment generating function. Right, so this is something that I'm assuming everybody's comfortable with. And again, this is a picture we saw in the last, uh, in yesterday's lecture by Bernard. So this is a large division rate function. It takes, it's non-negative and it takes value zero at the expectation. Typically, this is the nice shape, it's convex. All right, now consider a simple setting of two designs. We want to produce, uh, you know, there are negative results, so we might as well do it in a simpler setting. Uh, and now we just want to say whether the difference of the two samples is, has a positive mean or a negative mean. So let's just think of a single random variable. So we are given a random variable x with unknown mean e of x, and we want to decide whether e of x is positive or e of x is negative with error probability less than equal to delta. And we'll do this based upon whether sample average is greater than zero or sample average is less than zero, right? So now you can see, suppose e of x is less than zero, then probability of false selection. So you'll make a false selection if x bar n turns out to be greater than zero. And this is approximated on large deviation scaling by exponential of, uh, you know, this minus n, then this is the rate function evaluated at zero. On the other hand, if e of x was positive, then again, probability of false selection is x bar n less than zero. And this again is just approximated by e to the power minus n with the rate function evaluated at zero. So let's just focus on estimating the rate function at value zero. Right, this is clear. So two-phase implementation, just to, you know, uh, 
further illustrate this point. So if I have log 1 by delta upon i0 number of samples, if I knew i0, then this would ensure that probability of false selection is less than or equal to delta. So hence, one reasonable procedure is I'll generate log 1 by delta amount of samples, some order of log 1 by delta samples, to estimate the rate function i of 0. And let me come up with the estimator as i hat of m of 0. And then in the second phase, since it's log 1 by delta, I can throw these samples away. Constants don't matter. In the second phase, I'll uh, generate these many samples, log 1 by delta upon the estimate of i of 0, i hat m of 0, right? And then I'll decide that the sign of e of x based upon whether x bar n is greater than 0 or x bar n is less than or equal to 0. It's a very reasonable procedure. In the first phase, you estimate the log moment, uh, the, the rate function, and then the second phase, you use the estimate to do your simulation. So we'll now discuss estimation of i of 0. And 0 is, uh, you know, this, this can be scaled to be any i of x, but I'll focus on 0 right now. So estimating the rate function. So what is the rate function at 0? So remember, it's the fenchel legendre transform. When you evaluate at 0, it's simply the infimum of the log moment generating function, negative of the infimum of the log moment generating function. Right, so the picture to keep in mind is log moment generating function looks is a convex function. It's a nice function like this. The mean I'm assuming is negative, so the slope here is negative. And I want to estimate this i of 0. It's a minimum value here. Uh, so what will I do? I'll generate uh, you know, these samples x i i equal to 1 through m. I'll have this empirical moment generating function and empirical log moment generating function. And I'll take its minimum, and that's my estimator for the rate function. So in pictorially, you know, this is what I want to I generate x1 through xm samples, I may get something like this. And now this becomes an estimator for the rate function. If I made a, if the sample was really bad, it turned out to be that the sample average turned out to be positive as opposed to negative, then I may get something like this. Right? But both of these are identical. This is kind of empirical homogeneity function is the homogeneity function of empirical distribution. You're saying just use that as a probability. Yeah, exactly right. yeah, so right now we just thought that we'll implement that particular strategy where we estimate the moment generating function. So we are following up on that argument right now. Okay, so now, so one result that you get, and it's quite intuitive, is that suppose A is greater than I of 0. So law of large of numbers will tell you that this, uh, this estimator will converge to I of 0. And now suppose I look at A is greater than I of 0, so I'm asking, what's the probability that this estimated rate function takes a large deviation upwards, right? Now that has this very nice form. So this is the same as this uh, empirical average here of the moment generating function, taking a deviation, you know, infimum of this over theta, coming downwards from its norm. And let's just look at the picture for this. What we are saying is, this estimator for this, what's the probability it goes downwards, and there's some A here. E to bar, uh, well, some A here, let's say. So the, what's the most likely way that's going to happen? Well, the most likely way is you fix any theta, and now you just have some of ID variables, and those ID variables take a large deviation downwards. And amongst all of them, you choose find the theta which makes this event most likely. So that's exactly what this result says. It's infimum uh, theta in R. This is just the log moment, uh, this is just the rate function corresponding to E of theta xi. Right? So it's very intuitive. You'd expect to see this result. It's, Fairly easy to show. Uh, so this is just the, log, uh, the rate function for log moment function of this variable here. Similarly, for a less than i0, so what if now the rate function takes a deviation downwards from the mean? So that will turn out to be a supremum of these guys, because that would correspond to these empirical averages taking a large deviation upwards. It will be supremum of i theta of e of my, minus i. So what that means here is that now I'm saying, what if this curve that I'm trying to estimate takes a value upwards? I look at all these thetas, and all of them have to go up. So minimum, so the worst case, the most likely amongst them has to also go up, and that's going to determine the rate function. So that's what's exactly captured by uh, uh, quantity here. So okay, now, once we have these estimators, uh, okay, so I'll generate these many samples. This is I, my estimator for the rate function. Um, in the second phase, I have these many samples. And now my probability of false selection, because I have these many samples, 
I0 is the true rate function at value rate 0. So it's just going to be an expectation of this quantity here, of this exponential here. Right? That's my unconditioned probability of false uh, selection. And you can see why this is, how this is false selection is going to happen. You'll come up with paths where the rate function is, uh, takes a small value. Estimated rate function takes an unusually small value. So you give, um, sorry, large value. Large value, so you give too few samples in the second phase. And since you get too few samples in the second phase, you made a mistake. So now this, uh, so if you use Vardhan's integral lemma, this has a very nice uh, representation that this probability of false selection just has this expression here. Um, in particular, uh, probability of false selection, if I use log 1 by delta samples, I'll always get this result, that you know, I won't get the kind of efficiency that I'm looking for. But uh, the big point, interesting point is this. So I've said that the trouble happens when this rate function takes a large value. What that means is trouble happens when this function in average here takes a small value, very small value. That's counter, you know, when we looked at this problem, we thought when you're empirically estimating these things, what you have to worry about is that although x i's are light tailed, these exponential of theta x i's are fat tailed. And fat tails are bad because, you know, the sum gets affected by a single variable taking a massive value. Right? That, that causes all kinds of problems. So we thought that's going to cause all kinds of uh, problems here. Surprisingly, <clears throat> this guy taking small values is unaffected by these unusually large values of x i's. Right? If theta is positive, x i takes an unusually large value, that sample won't even show up here. If uh, theta is negative, x i takes a large value, this is just tiny, it doesn't contribute anything. So it's, it's in some sense a positive news that you know, those uh, large values are not going to distort your estimator here. But we haven't exploited this so far, but it's just something worth observing, that this is, that this is less bad than what we expected. All right, so now key negative result uh, is that let L denote a collection of probability distribution with fi a finite mean, unbounded positive support that are equivalent to each other, and let P epsilon delta denote a policy that can adaptively sample from any two distributions in L. So it'll sample from any two distributions in L. Suppose they're separated by epsilon and mean. And it'll find the correct one with probability of false selection bounded by delta in this cell. Right? So suppose I have such an algorithm. And the claim theorem is that for any two distributions in L with arbitrarily apart mean, a P epsilon delta policy on an average would require more than order log 1 by delta samples. So order log one by delta will not work. So I'll just give you a hint of how one kind of makes this argument. So details are, so consider two populations. Xi has distribution f with mean mu f. This, all of this is under probability measure p of a. Yi has distribution g with mean mu g less than mu f minus epsilon. So they're separated. Suppose I want to find the, I guess I'm looking at maybe best system being the one with the largest mean. So I want to find f is the correct, uh, f would be the correct judgment here. And under probability measure PB, XI again has distribution F, while YI now has distribution G tilde with mu F, uh, with mean which is mu F plus epsilon, greater than mu F plus epsilon. So in, in this case, I should select F, and that would be a correct decision. In this case, if I select F, that would be a wrong decision. Under P of B, that would be a wrong decision. My algorithm will look at the same samples, XI's and YI's. Under measure P of A, the correct choice would be uh, F, under this, the correct choice would be G tilde. So the theorem is, under such a policy, E of the time taken under probability measure A, uh, to the number of samples of uh, G gen generated, divided by log 1 by delta, is at least 1 upon uh, the inverse of this, is kullback liable distance between G and G tilde. So this is a result which is easy to prove. But the punchline is that given any, two, any distribution G, I can always find another distribution with entropy arbitrarily close and mean arbitrarily far. So I can just take small mass from here and place it quite far away. So the support is unbounded. I need that and place it far away. And that will be entropically, it'll be arbitrarily close. So I can make uh, this denominator arbitrarily small while the separation can be arbitrary. Hence, uh, this effort cannot be log 1 by 
this would be infinite when I soup over all the g tilde. So that's the, that's the idea. That there are distributions which are difficult to separate. Uh, okay, so what else do I want to say here? Uh, Yeah, I think the point I want to say was this need not just be for expectations. You know, it could be that I'm comparing these distributions not based on the expectations, but based on their quantiles, medians, and all of that. Same kind of negative result would hold in that setting as well. This is, I'm just assuming all the distributions, well, yeah. I mean, I could restrict myself to light tail distribution and still the result will hold. The proof, let me just give you a very quick idea. I'm running out of time, but this is from Lyon Robbins. The seminal ideas come from Lyon Robbins' 1985 paper. This has spawned a lot of research in multi arm bandits. Minor and cyclists do something similar um, in discrete setting. That under probability measure A, selecting F was something which will happen with very high probability. This tilde you can ignore for now, just very high probability. Uh, under probability measure B, this is an unlikely event. Now I can relate these two measures from the by their likelihood ratio. And the likelihood ratio is just exponential times number of steps into uh, something which is converging to pull back liable distance. Now, you know, so it's, this thing looks a lot like uh, number of steps into uh, something which is converging to pull back liable distance. You do some more analysis and you can actually come up with the result. You play with the constants basically, then uh, it's, it's quite straightforward. All right. Uh, so the, the point is, in, under P of B, this is small, but this has a representative probability measure A of the data function into the likelihood ratio. Uh, under E of A, this event is quite likely. Now, if this looks a lot like a constant, if you do a few um, maneuverings to get this to look like a constant on a, on a nice set, then this set has large probability, this has, has small probability, so this term in between has to be small. That's the idea, basically. All right, so this is what I just mentioned to you earlier. So let me just go, uh, let me just move ahead. That this is the point that kullback lidar distance between G and G tilde can be made arbitrarily small, even though they are well separated. That mu G tilde can be much larger than mu of G. So way forward. So additional information is needed to attain log one by delta convergence rates. So that's one, uh, one uh, takeaway from here. Often, upper bounds on moments may be available, at least in simulation bound, um, uh, models. So one uh, inspiration for this work came from a literature in simulation, where, as I mentioned, the transportation example, you have a complex example, simulation model, <coughs> where the output whose distribution you don't know, you can sample from it. So in, you know, because you have a well-defined mathematical model with well-defined inputs, you can often come up with upper bounds on the, mom, uh, uh, on the moments uh, of quantities of interest. So using such bounds, we can develop epsilon delta strategies by truncating random variables while controlling the error to be less than epsilon, and then use something like Hovde's, Hovding's concentration quality. Um, yeah, so I'll talk more about this. And recent multi-arm bandits do this in a sequential and adaptive manner. So I'll try to indicate something in this direction. So let me just give you an idea. So suppose I'm looking at a single random variable x, which is now bounded. So it's between a and b. Suppose its expectation is separated from epsilon, and I want to decide whether its expectation is positive or negative. So I'll just generate samples x1 through xn of x. So I'm just illustrating this in a very simple setting. If x bar n is greater than or equal to zero, I'll declare that the mean is positive. If x bar n is less than zero, I'll declare the mean is negative. Uh, now you can see, since I'm, I've assumed this separation by epsilon, so probability that x bar n greater than or equal to zero is dominated by the probability x bar minus e of x is greater than equal to epsilon, and for which I have this nice bound from Hovding's inequality. And that tells me that if I choose my n to be this value, so it's a order log one by delta algorithm, then indeed I have a p epsilon delta policy for any x in this population. Now this generalizes easily to many designs. This is not just for one random variable. You can design, you can come up with similar kind of um, number of samples that are required for each design to achieve, log, to achieve delta accuracy. OK, so now suppose f is increasing, strictly increasing convex function. And think of f as maybe being, a, being a, you know, um, a just a polynomial x to the power alpha with alpha greater than 1, or exponential function of x. And suppose we know that e of f of x is less than or equal to a. And for now, let me just assume that x is non-negative. 
then, you know, when I truncate at u, I look at all such random variables, uh, which I'm going to truncate at u, and I look at the error that I'm going to induce by this. So I have maximum over all such random variables, which have this constraint on them. This maximum truncation error can be bounded. And this can be done um, uh, even if I didn't truncate, but I capped it. If I put here minimum of x and u instead of x and indicator of x is equal to u. So one can still, that bounds a slightly more uh, elaborate bound, but one can get a, these bounds. And the, the, this is very easy to see. The essential problem the point is that, you know, you only need to look at two point distributions. When you solve, so I'm solving this optimization problem. I want to maximize this, this truncation error subject to this constraint. And it's an easy argument to make that uh, for anything which can solve it, this condition. Uh, by Jensen's inequality, they'll still satisfy this, and they'll give the same answer here. So you might as well refer to two-point distributions, and now it's a very easy optimization problem, and that gives you these kinds of bounds. Uh, so in any case, so now once you have this control over the truncation error, so you can control the error, now your random variables are bounded, you can use Hobding kind of ideas and develop your log one by delta algorithms. So that's the spirit of things. I'll just give you a flavor of multi-arm bandit literature on this, so pure exploration. Um, so this is a picture, uh, so how many of you are familiar with multi-arm bandit terminology? Or how many of you are hearing it for the first time? Most of you are hearing it for the first time. So this literature uh, is, is extremely popular. It's, uh, you know, like I said, it's for discrete stochastic optimization. You're given number of arms, number of options. Each time you pull them, you get a sample from them. And uh, you have to decide, you know, you want to again pull carefully and find the best arm. Best arm can be, as I said, you want to minimize the probability of wrong selection, or there could be other objectives. Uh, the main thing about this literature is it captures very nicely the exploration and exploitation trade-off. You know, when we do this search, you explore and you find something good that you want to exploit. So it is an extremely elegant job of these trade-offs. There are very nice upper and lower bounds on computational effort, which are very close to each other of the proposed algorithms. Uh, in this setting, there's a very nice algorithm. Uh, it's simple enough, so it's worth kind of illustrating. I have a few minutes. Suppose I have n arms. Each arm A when sample gives a Bernoulli reward with mean P of A. I want to find the arm with the largest mean P of A. Right. So this is a strategy by Evan Dar and others in 2006. It's a sequential sampling strategy. Uh, okay. So anyway, I, right now I guess the point of this slide is simply to show that they have an order log one by delta algorithm. But let me give you a flavor of what their strategy is. You sample each arm A once, every time for all the arms that are available to you, so you generate one sample each. Uh, and you look at these sample averages. Now, whenever the sample average is, the best sample average is sufficiently far from arm A sample average, there's some function alpha t, which is deterministic, you come up with like this. Whenever this inequality is true, you throw away the arm t. So it's successive elimination. So you keep on throwing until you're left with the last arm, and that's the winner. And why it works, again, is uh, quite intriguing. The point is this. Suppose I have two designs. This is with mean mu of 2, and this is with mean mu of a. t is the number of samples being generated. I can identify these cone-looking objects, these good sets. These good sets will have probability 1 minus delta. And the, po uh, the point is, my sample averages will remain in these good sets in both, for the, both the populations with probability 1 minus delta. All the rogue parts which misbehave, when you know, some uh, samples are uh, extremely odd, are all thrown away in the delta. In this uh, 1 minus delta set, the sample average is staying this, uh, here. This has a nice property that the inequality which I showed you will never be satisfied by the best design, and all the bad design will eventually go away, will eventually be rejected. So it's as elegant as that. You, know, you kind of reduce, as computer science often do, reduce a stochastic problem to a discrete deterministic problem. So you just identify a good region where things are well-behaved and uh, throw everything else away. Okay, so now all of this, uh, so there was a paper by Bubek, uh, Cesar Bianchi, and Lugosi in 2013, where they developed log one by delta algorithms in a different setting. Regret is you want to keep p pulling up these arms so as on the long-term average of rewards you maximize. So that's, uh, that's, that's a different objective from what we are doing right now. But they achieve uh, optimal regret when uh, one plus epsilon moments of each arm output are available. Um, and the idea there is, the way they achieve things is they kind of truncate every arm. They have these, so I'm assuming one plus epsilon moment bounds of each arm are available. So each arm has unbounded distribution. 
but we have mo moments bound on the one plus first moment, one plus epsilon moment of each arm. That's available to us. With that, info, with that explicit bound available to us, I'll truncate each arm, but I'll increase the truncation as I go along. And I'll have a rejection criteria as before. You know, when two means are far enough, I'll reject them. So you do this uh, carefully, you can, uh, and then use clever use of Bernstein inequality. So that works better than Hofdings in this setting. Uh, so, so these algorithms exist. What they don't do is they don't cap, they truncate, uh, they don't adapt to pure exploration setting. So all of those things can be done through that, and then you get nice algorithms. So the big picture is it can be done when you know more information, but right now the algorithms rely on truncation or capping. Um, and no use of large deviation theory. Now, potentially, one could make a case that all these algorithms have this elegant log one by delta performance, but maybe in practice they are quite bad. And maybe large deviation rate function or some other information from generated samples can further improve things. So that's the direction that needs to be explored. But uh, this is how we get positive results. So in conclusion, uh, we discussed in light tail settings the probability of all selection decays at an exponential rate suggesting that order log one by delta computation algorithms that upper bound this probability of delta may be feasible. So that was the thought earlier. That's why this whole literature kind of took off. However, we show through a series of negative results that this convergence rate or order log one by delta algorithms are not possible for unbounded support distributions without further restriction. Under explicit restriction, the moments of underlying random variables, one can design these things. <coughs> Thank you. So when you were discussing this estimation of the of the rate function, you said it's the it, it, it the, the large values don't bother you and the small values do, and 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 the reason for that is that you're looking for the smallest mean. Yeah, we are. That's right. We want that large deviation rate function. Right. So 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 it that, that that's the reason why 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 the short, short value the small values can given that's right and can give you trouble, right? That's right. That's right. Okay. So conspiratorial behavior of small values is giving us trouble. They all have to kind of have a, take a large deviations away from their norm. Right. Um, the, the, I have one more question. So you say uh, when you have moment conditions, then you can, uh, then you can get down to the order of log. Right. Are, are there other quantities that would be uh, also helpful, like, like, like uh, entropy? Because you, you, at some sure. point you were talking about relative entropy. Right. So I think the answer is that the really the, what separates two populations and what determines the computational effort is a relative entropy. Yeah. So maybe theory should approach these problems from that viewpoint. Right. That, that's a fair point. Yeah, I think that's something worth exploring. Uh, it's on my list. Other question? Well, uh, would it improve something to uh, complement the uh, large deviation estimate for the probability of false selection uh, by uh, correcting terms? Uh, Estimate uh, instead of using the, the Kramer bound, uh, complementing with uh, corrections, the Gaussian corrections, and well, the negative result was very kind of emphatic, right? That negative result didn't talk about how large deviation rate function was estimated. So I think that still holds. That's the answer. Okay. So thank you. Uh, thank you again. Thank you.